Well, uh, good afternoon uh, to all people, and um, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, final closing session. Um, I know that some people had to take uh, early flights, and so um, I'm very grateful to those who have stayed right to the bitter end, and hopefully we will not disappoint you, and we know that there are so many interesting side events occurring after this. But we've had a really wonderful week and uh, lots of things that, uh, for different people, different kinds of take-home messages. Um, so we thought that we would like to uh, bring this event uh, to a close uh, by asking a panel um, to share with us some of the lessons learned and ideas that um, 
they uh, would like us to consider. Um, so we asked um, Maggie Catley Carson, who is the vice chair of the Canadian Water Network and also uh, a member of our esteemed uh, international advisory panel, um, if she would chair this, this um, uh, event. And we asked three of her colleagues on the international advisory panel uh, to become members of this closing panel because that way they could, could uh, share their ideas collectively with all of us. Um, so we are also um, pleased to have on the panel uh, Bashir Jama, who is the Director of Soil Health at the Alliance for a Green Revolution uh, in Africa, AGRA. Um, also Uma Lele, who is an independent scholar and development economist uh, based in Washington, D.C., um, and Martin Passman, who is a farmer and president of Valmont Industries uh, de Argentina. So, uh, Maggie, let me invite you up first uh, with your colleagues. Oh, where did we, oh, we're mic'd, and we're on, my goodness. Okay, why don't I sit in the middle? <laughs> yeah. There we are. Do you want to be in the middle? You can be anywhere you want to. There's no middle of four. It takes advanced mathematics to figure these things out. <laughs> I believe they're not projecting. Hmm? No, I hope not yet. No, they're not, I don't think they're, yeah. We'll put the, we'll ask you for the slide when we need it, okay? Thank you, as all, as every single session, people have been saying, I can't see a thing, and believe me, it's true when you get up here. Uh, no, it's a... Good afternoon, thank you, Roberto. Thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to, uh, to have this time with everybody to uh, reflect on what we've done together. And uh, I'm joined as, Roberto said, by three members of the advisory panel. What you may not uh, appreciate is that this advisory panel is very new, that we've met collectively for the first time this time. So what you're going to be hearing is not what we usually say to each other. We have no habit of what we usually say to each other. We're just figuring out how to work together, but it's, uh, uh, it's a joy to uh, be able to have this opportunity. And uh, Bashir, as you heard, is from, is from Africa, he's working with AGRA, but he's also worked with UNDP, uh, and he's, a, he's an agroeconomist. Uh, Uma is a very distinguished economist. She's worked for the World Bank for Thank years, you. so she has a very particular perspective. She never stops thinking about economics and how this fits with everything, which is good. Uh, <laughs> Martin, uh, when he says he's a farmer, let me tell you, he's a big farmer, and uh, I don't mean waistline, I mean he really has some big farms. <laughs> so when we talk about the 600,000 small farmers and there are 600 million small farmers in the world, it's, it's not Martin. That's a, it's a different kind of farming, absolutely. Uh, I'm a Canadian, I work, I've worked in international development for many years and sit on a number of boards that work on water issues. We're joined in the advisory committee, just so that you know, by Peter Rogers, Colin Chartres, who you may, you might have seen either of these, both of these around, uh, Martin Foghetti and, uh, no, Carlos Foghetti, sorry, and Pasquale Seduto, who has made a present, very interesting presentation here. So that's the t total advisory group. Okay, so what are we going to do this afternoon? Uh, well, uh, the main thing we can do to help the Dougherty Water and Food Foundation is to reflect on what we really are taking away, what we're taking home from uh, this conference. What, in other words, what was remarkable about it to people who are not completely short of conferences to go to. Uh, what was really remarkable about it. Uh, secondly, uh, how you take the, the messages of the conference and the ideas of the conference to a, the working life, to the, the life that, and the goals that we want to achieve. Uh, and then the third part, uh, where you have a role, is what, from here, where do we go? 
What are the ideas that really need to be explored? What, ha what has this conference raised in all of our minds about ideas and concepts that need to be explored? So uh, after we finish the first two bits, we're going to go out and ask you just two questions, and brevity will be very much appreciated here. What's the, single, what's the biggest message you're taking home from this conference? And two, where should we go with that message or with other messages? Where, where should the Dougherty Foundation be looking for, the next, uh, for its next themes for the next conferences? And then we'll wind up by saying where we think it should go, and we'll see if we've got a series of messages that we can hand over to them. So that's basically uh, what it is that we're going to be doing. Um, First thing, just some general comments on the conference. I think it's been an amazingly well-organized conference, uh, right from the very beautiful binders that were put together. This looks like a piece of Tiffany art on the front. Uh, the, uh, the organization, the, uh, the, the scheduling, I, I found it an uncrowded conference, which is a great, uh, a great compliment because uh, far too often, one simply rushes from session to session without getting much chance to absorb it. And I found the quality of the presentations and the choice of speakers was really admirable, and I learned a very great deal. <coughs> How do you feel about the conference, Martin? Really, it's my fourth time here. Oh. I enjoy it a lot from my farmer point of view. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I think that it's great, that it is creating great value for all the countries, for all the people, and for the water users. Any particular point to the organization that you would bring up? Uh... Excellent. I do not have so much experience mm -hmm. in these type of meetings, but while well, I travel for different countries and participate in different meetings, I think that it was excellent. Good. Uma, any com comments well, on the conference organization? Yeah. You know, uh, first I want to congratulate the <coughs> organizers for this conference. I, I go to many of them, uh, I have to say, and uh, what I found very attractive about this conference is that there were several sectors that were very well represented. The private sector, academics of very high quality uh, foundations. I think I probably would have liked to see a little more representation of the civil society than there was. Uh, but in general, the diversity of points of view and looking at the world and the quality of presentations and the range of issues. I, I was really glad to see that it was Water for Food conference, but there was discussion of health and climate change. And so, yes, I think the organizers get great kudos for organizing a nice conference. Thank you. Bashir, any? Yeah. Um... It was really well organized. As, as Maggie, I go to a lot of conferences. <laughs> and um, after the second day, usually I'm looking for an exit strategy. <laughs> um, but this one I stayed through, and I really enjoyed all the sessions. And the posters, it was very good to have those students. Um, the, um, um, what can I say, the food. Oh. Yeah, it was very good. Uh, and the mixture of, uh, of different perspectives, global, uh, national, uh, regional, the ability to think outside your own and see something else that complements your, your own uh, profession and, uh, and area of work. That was really good. Yeah, good. What I particularly liked, and then I'm going to turn over to Martina and say what were the two or three points that he found that really most important. But what I particularly liked was there was a real effort to say, okay, here's the developments in small data, here's the developments in big data, but to try and make those two come together. And to say, how is the small data influencing the big data? How is the big data in influencing the small data? I like the fact that you were trying to complete those circles. Mm -hmm. So, Martin, what, what major points are you going to be taking home with you for the, from the sessions? Uh, They've all been taking copious notes, so very impressive. Really, all the, the conferences that I heard were very interesting, and so there are a lot of points that I'm taking home to work on. But well, uh, I want to, re to reflect a little bit about good food security and sustainability, that it is more in what I, what I am, data revolution and global yield gap. Uh, about 
food security. Uh, our population is growing to 9.2 billion in 2050. We must produce 70 to 100 percent more food than today with less land. I'm a farmer, so I know what to is to have less land. To move from one acre per people to 0.3, so one third. With less water, I have farms with irrigation, so without water, I cannot produce anything in that area, not a single kernel of any crop. So I depend 100% in irrigation. We know that we will have more competition of the cities and also of, the, of energy with the water. And the conditions of climate change, we are suffering the farmers in all these years. More hot, more dry conditions, more insects, more disease, weeds, more pressure. Uh, we need to, to find that climate resilience agriculture. We are working on that. Not only is important the amount or the quantity of the food. It is very important the quality of the food that we must produce. Uh, I heard some years ago a doctor in Argentina that he, he, he's working in Childs of less than three years in protein. He says that if we cannot give protein before the three years, before they are three years old, they're intelligent, it's going to be very bad. They, we must uh, build their brains, and that it is protein in the first two or three years of life. So it's very important for us to produce more protein, not for the richest medium classes, but also in the very poor countries. To, to create brains in those small kids, no? Um, and all the, this, we have to produce it in a very sustainable way. We said with less water, and water is the resource that more impact in our yield. If I do not have enough water, my yields are going down, and food security is also redu being reduced. So we must increase yields with less water. That's what we have to do. So more crop per drop. And what I heard that it was first time, more protein per drop. <coughs> so for me, it's very important that. So people were talking about protein per drop. People talked about protein per drop. Oh, good. Yes. I didn't hear that. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And at the Gates Foundation, we also in the video was that they want to, uh, to focus 20% uh, of their resources in producing livestock, in producing protein. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is very important to reach those poor people, poor childs of the world now, mm -hmm. to create more brain to, yeah. so we can have a better base for educating them. Good. About data revolution is the other point. It is amazing amount, the amount of data that we are receiving today. And we are just in the beginning. On next years, the growth will be amazing too. We need precision data and, have to, and how to use it. Today, in my farm, I'm receiving a lot of data. And mostly, I am, stor I am storing it. But I know that in the near future, all that data, it will be of great help for my operation. So today it is, I have information. Really, most of that, I do not know how to use it, or I do not have the tools to use it. But in this conference, we talk a lot about the way how this data, it will be used in the near future. Do we need to talk about whether farmers have the tools to use it? Yes, there is a lot of data that we have the tools today, but I think that we have much more data than what we are using. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that we are in the beginning of a big change on that, that we are going to use all that data. So we need uh, data that transform that information in something useful to us, uh, data that will resolve truly problems to us, not only have data 
to have data, no? Does anybody ever come to you and say, what data do you need? No, <laughs> but I also did not make any questions so they know that I was asking for that. <laughs> I don't mean here necessarily, okay, but that's but, an interesting point. But well, really, uh, I think that uh, there is an amazing amount of, of information and there is an uh, amazing amount of people working of converting that data in true information for us. Uh, all that information uh, will generate a great change in sustainability in our farms because in, when we have precision farming, we are reducing the, our, our inputs and we are increasing our yields. We are having more productivity. So I think that all that information will help us in being more sustainable. For this, we need education, training, and extension services. So we need to work a lot on education, training, and extension. For the developed agricultural countries and also for the undeveloped and smallholder farmers countries, no? for both. Uh, we must deliver all these results to the farmers. As Dr. Norman Borlaug says, take it to the farmers. If we do not take all that information, all that knowledge to the farmers, we are working for papers. So right. as a farmer, I said, please <laughs> help us bring in all that information to us. And <clears throat> saying that, I, Maggie says that I am a big farmer. Well, yes, I'm a bigger farmer in Argentina, a big farmer in Argentina. But I think that what we do, we can extrapolate that for many small farmers in all around the world. So farmers, we talk the same language. So I think that what I says that we need helps also all the farmers all the world, on the world. Uh, we must deliver results to the end users. I, I said that a moment ago. And we must think in the next generation of farmers. Good. So we must train the small, because what I said today, perhaps the gen, the, all this data, we do not know very well how to use it. A lot of data, yes, but there is much more than what we're using. Mm -hmm. So, so there's not just a yield gap, there's a data gap. Yes, the data gap. No, I'm talking about the data gap. So I think that with, with uh, training the, 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 the next generation and all that, it is like the phones. Today, if we need to ask something of the phone, we are going to ask our kids of 7, 10 years old that they will teach us. Uh, OK, your third point. The third point, uh, it is about yield gap. For me, it is very interesting, all the information that was and is generated in the global yield gap and water productivity. Understanding those differences between actual yield and potential yield, I find that it is not difficult to reach the no hunger yield of three tons instead of the actual of 1.5 tons in corn in Africa. I said there was in two different conferences that to reach, we, if we reach to three tons yield in corn, uh, we cover mostly the hunger of Africa. So as a farmer, I said with information, the agronomies, uh, uh, knowledge that we have, with the seed uh, technology that there is today in the world, it is not difficult to reach that. Robert Frawley says that with the first uh, trials that they have, they reached four point something in yield. In no, in, in Tillage farming, I said that with no tillage, we can grow a lot, but well, I will talk about that after. We have the genetics and the agronomic management to close this gap. We must work hard to close it. We have to resolve the problems of biotech, social regularity, and political restrictions. I think that, that it is very important to close that yield gap. We must think that poor Small farmers today have less than one hectare, no genetics, no marketing access, no insurance, low, very low yields, and they need to support their families for food and for education. In the area that I, where I have at the farm, that is the central part of Argentina, Western Cordoba, in the year 1860 was a Catholic priest that they sent him to, the, to an undeveloped and po very poor area. He says, because before teaching religion, I must help them to develop. And he says, 
I must, I must, I must make roads. It was year 860, 500 kilometers of, of Dutch roads he opened. A market, he, he promote and open markets for them. He teach them how to irrigate and how to do farming. And the, th the fourth thing was teach the woman, ah. the young woman, amazing. Uh, for me, I am very devoted of him. He's going to be a saint in the next years. So how come and, 100 and, years later we haven't absorbed that message? Yes, <laughs> yes, that's amazing. Then Dr. Borlaug says more or less the same yeah. in, in the 20th century, and now we are saying the same. Okay, so. Th thank you. <laughs> Uma, you're going to talk about the yield gap too, I think, when yes, we come I am. to you. It, okay, uh, that's great. Bashir thank you. <clears throat> Bashir. Yeah. Um, what did you take away? My thanks so much, three, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Martin. <laughs> Actually, by coincidence, my first takeaway uh, is that of uh, take it to the farmer uh, that Martin's um, talked about. Just to strike me from the first speaker of the uh, conference, that was Jeff Rex, when even him as a, as a farmer in a developed uh, country, a developed world, is struggling to some extent with the need for more precise data that can help him target those solutions to raising productivity. And, and this is one farmer with one uh, large farm with uh, a lot of opportunities to use GIS and remote sensing and high-tech so solutions. So a farmer is a farmer, as uh, Martin said. Now, the thought that triggered in me there was, was how can I take what I had to many smallholder farmers, and in Jeff's farm there will be thousands of them, not one Jeff. Uh, with a lot of variability uh, within and across their farms. So I think the, 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 the challenge for us will be, uh, the, what excited me is the range, how you can use data, and big and small, to help farmers make wise decisions. But what I also had and I took away is that farmers need data they can trust. Mm -hmm. and, and for that to happen, we have to co-create that data and that information with them. And this is particularly important in a place where you don't have one, but large number of farmers, smallholder farmers, where one mistake could be, could be fatal, uh, especially if they have that small farm and don't have much other options. So the, I, the notion of co-creating solution with farmers is really uh, important because that helps buy-in, creates action, creates outcomes, words that we had right from the beginning. And so we'll come back to it, but that will require uh, some further thinking on how actually can you, can you get there. And I saw some very, uh, all through the discussion, some approaches, uh, particularly that institutions like the University of Nebraska and others are, are doing. The second one that, uh, that, uh, that um, um, again, the same, my second one is the same as that of, of Martino, and that's the, I was very impressed with this uh, yield gap maps. You can criticize it and say, so what? And we'll get to the so what at some point in the discussion. But the fact that these scientists across a range of geographies, countries, Asia, Africa, um, US, got together standardized approach, began from what was known, fine-tuned the protocols to a point where they are now giving us hope that we can actually, if we do what they have suggested, we can feed these nine billion people by the year 2050. The how and the other missing parts are issues we can discuss, but that has really provided something that now we can take it up and communicate with the rest of the world and uh, bring in the other pieces of socioeconomics. Uh, but to me, that was a, a big wow, and I really would like to salute that team. My third takeaway is, is, uh, is the need to improve communication in what we do, particularly in this area of uh, water and uh, uh, agriculture, and um, which 
And agriculture, I heard for the first time, uses 80% of that water. We heard uh, when people talk of uh, water scarcity globally, it's not so much of drinking water, but water for agriculture. And so how we need to bring the communication down in ways uh, that is simple, that is easy for uh, policy makers, for private sector, for real people, eh? like Martins here, who have to make 40 decisions, 40 to 50 decisions as we had at a farm to use. Now I'm thinking we have had the big and the small data, and I saw a lot of expertise uh, in this part of the world to analyze that data rigorously and draw up solution, conclusions and recommendations that can easily be rolled. Where I'm coming from in Africa, leave alone big data, even the small data we have challenges analyzing. And so how, what can we do together to help each other in ways that we can really synthesize this knowledge in ways that people can use it to make decisions? I think that will be our, right. our next challenge. So Those are my three take takeaways. it to the farmer, yield gap is a potentially great instrument and the need to communicate better, differently, and yeah. with more precision. Just like precision agriculture, like precision. we need precision communication. Yeah. One of my problems with communication is we always communicate the problems and we really don't communicate that there are solutions and we don't do that as well. And particularly at the political level, uh, you know, if you've ever worked at the political level, the last thing you need is somebody bringing in another six problems before lunch. Uh, and if you can bring in some solutions, you're likely to get mm -hmm. uh, a, a much better reception. Uma, give Thank us your you. wisdom, your three points. And yes, well, I, I have been reflecting a lot uh, based on the last three days, and I, I decided that I'll put together some use of big and small data that economists have been doing in the last uh, many years uh, to give you a picture of how the world is changing very rapidly. And so some of the discussions that we have had uh, in the last three days, what does it mean in terms of what we do going forward? So uh, I'm going to show you a few slides and I was very stimulated by Ken Kassman's presentation of what's happened to world market prices so, uh, and how that has been changing, amount of area coming under uh, cultivation, etc. Uh, so Ken was referring to the 10-year data uh, from about uh, 2000 to 2011, 12. And this happens to be 100-year data on world prices. Uh, what it shows is that um, the long-term trend has been declining um, in the real world prices uh, of agriculture. And that is mainly because there's been huge growth in productivity uh, as a result of investment in science and technology. And much of what we were talking about was about investment in science and technology. And you can see that every time there is a big peak in prices, then it leads to some stimulation of investment. So I'll show you the, the next slide, I think, uh, shows what happened to foreign aid uh, when prices increased substantially. So in the early 70s, when there was a huge peak in prices, uh, lending to agriculture went up a lot, including to agricultural research. CGIR was established, and a combination of that investment in irrigation, for instance, which was very important for South Asia, um, and all that aid and also convincing governments that they needed to invest more in agriculture, uh, we saw substantial gains. But then you can see that um, investments by donors have declined considerably, and many of the economists have been debating about the extent to which that decline in foreign assistance and including by governments is a result of decline in real prices. So what I wanted to leave, this was uh, prompted by Ken Kassman's very thoughtful uh, evidence that uh, prices matter. And prices matter now increasingly at the global level because we've become much more interconnected. So we should be, when we think of investments and decisions and what farmers do, 
uh, that will make a big difference. So, this changed uh, state of uh, overseas development assistance has some very fundamental implications of in terms of what we do based on the very thoughtful discussions we had in so the... So do you think, do you agree with Ken that prices are going up or...? Oh, uh, we, nobody knows what will happen to prices. You know, the one thing economists can't predict is anything. That's because they only have two so, hands. Uh, it's exactly. on the one hand and the yeah. other hand, but on the other other hand. <laughs> yeah, but we can tell what happened as a result of prices over the last hundred years. So the next slide uh, is on what has happened to ODA and you can see that uh, the green line is uh, assistance to agriculture by uh, donor agencies and it had peaked but it has and it has gone up a little bit but the amount of aid going to developing countries is far less than what it used to be before so we are we have to do much more with fewer resources and therefore imagination is going to matter a lot in terms of quality of partnerships in exchanging knowledge, etc. Uh, the next slide is uh, the Goodness. huge differences in productivity that we talked about and Ken's, uh, Ken mentioned the yield gap, but here you see yields uh, output per hectare and output per worker because economists are, were concerned about more than uh, agronomic factors and you see the the huge gap between where sub-Saharan Africa is, uh, where Southeast Asia is, and where North America is. So in a way, one can look at this figure as the, uh, the man who went uh, to some place and found that nobody was wearing shoes and he said there's no market and another one said, well, nobody's wearing shoes, so there's a big market. So we have a huge market in transferring knowledge from countries that have high levels of productivity to the ones that are um, at low, operating at low levels. Uh, next slide, please. And here you can see the differences that Ken was talking about. Uh, this is total factor productivity rather than just differences in yields. And again, it tells the same story that Africa's uh, yields are lagging way behind, but its labor productivity is also lagging behind. And its investment in capital is lagging behind too, as you will see from the, uh, from the next slide. Um, but before we do that, I think we need to look at what FAO reports as the what's happening to growth in irrigation and the likely future growth in irrigation. And we discussed a lot about how difficult it is to know what the amount of area under irrigation is and how much water is being used. But basically the FAO's estimates are that uh, area irrigated would increase only by 6%. And you can see the steep rise earlier, which led to the productivity growth that we are talking about and the figures that I showed you earlier. Uh, we really need to do much better, we need to be much better about measuring um, water use uh, in agriculture. And these are fairly crude estimates which are presented by the governments and big data and small data need to be used to, to have a better handle over water use. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, what this shows is that investment in agriculture is very important and it comes from many sources, private sector, public sector, we talked a lot about the importance of investing in big data by the public sector and completely agree with Ken uh, that that is something that we need to emphasize very much. It's not enough for the private sector alone to be taking responsibility for big data, but there is much more to be done in agriculture through investments. Uh, and the next slide, I think it's almost the last one. You can see the big differences uh, in the extent to which countries have invested in agriculture. This is per capita capital formation. Uh, East Asia has done a lot, Europe has done a lot, Latin America and the Middle East because of investment in water. But look at South Asia and look at Africa. And you can see the gap analysis that we were talking about is a result of the fact that prices have been going down, governments have developed a sense of complacency, so have the donors, and developing countries, both the private sector and the farmers, 
have not been investing enough in agriculture to get the growth that we need. So I think our challenge is to use the knowledge that we have been garnering in the last three years to translate it to change this state of affairs. That's what I got out of this wow. presentation. Wow. <laughs> Thank Don't you. you wish that happened to you, that you went home and you were so inspired you created seven complex charts? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so this is all we need to do to transform agriculture, you see? Oh, that's all we need. That's okay. my list. Public policy and instruments, <laughs> clarity, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, and the Water for Food program can do a lot in each of these areas, I'm hoping. Thank you. Bashir, do you... Mm -hmm. What did you feel when Uma was talking about foreign development assistance going down and the possible importance of this? I've been feeling that the 21st century really wasn't primarily about development assistance, and it was really a great deal more important what governments themselves mm -hmm. decide to do. Uh, what do you see, the view from Africa on the, the role of, of development assistance as opposed to national investment in agriculture? Obviously, they, they should be complementary, <coughs> but... Yeah. I think there is a, um, a tremendous variability across countries. But in general, what you see in Africa is that um, the, the economies are growing. Uh, I think we had yesterday mm -hmm. some of the fastest growing uh, economies, six or so of them are in Africa. And with that, there is also a very strong commitment now in many now, countries yes. in Africa to grow their Changing. agriculture. Uh, uh, you all probably know what is called the CADEP, the Comprehensive uh, Africa Agriculture Development Program, under NEPAD, which is a political uh, entity of the African Union. There's a commitment there to grow investments uh, to at least 10 percent from 206 of the national budgets. At least 10 percent should go to to uh, agriculture, and many countries are. Uh, either there or close, and there are many who have actually crossed the 10%. Ethiopia is a good example. Um, so we see, on one hand, a strong public investments now in agriculture uh, and agricultural uh, uh, value chains. There is also a growing private sector investment in agriculture. And um, I think the two of them are creating hope that, uh, that uh, agriculture will now grow uh, sustainably. Of course, uh, the, there is an ODI uh, coming in, uh, but um, that is now being supplemented by a much more serious commitment from the governments themselves, which is commendable. Mm -hmm. Good. So we hope we can tweak that line slightly upward. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Yes, Martin. Yes, I want to add it on this of, of uh, public investments or private investments. For me, it is very important the farm to be a business. Yeah. For the one hectare farmer or to the big one, it must be a business. If we want to have sustainability, we need profitability. We cannot have sustainability without profitability. So the way to transform that farmer to make a, to be a better farmer, to grow a better family, to can educate him, it is to have profitability. So I think that all the public investment must try to help or make open roads, make the market, what we were talking, so he can have a business. Small one, but a business. Having a better farmer, he will have a better family, a better community, and a better world for all of us. Mm -hmm. Amen, I think. My three take-homes, um, more briefly, uh, the first one was that uh, data has made an amazing difference to the quality of healthcare messages and the quality of health knowledge about the impact of water uh, and differences in water and changes in water on public health. I was really uh, blown away by that panel and you know the old saw about you can have an awful lot of data without having information and then you can have an awful lot of information without having knowledge and you can have an awful lot of knowledge without having wisdom well I think they had actually many of the speakers most of the speakers had really managed to take the data that was available convert that into information convert that into knowledge and really were talking to us about the wisdom of you know what is going to ha is happening now in the health area 
uh, as a result of changes in water and food availability. Exactly one of the ones Martine talked about, uh, you know, what happens in the first thousand days of a child's life, including the conception to birth period, and without protein, uh, and with maximum, with dirty water, uh, the chances of the life chances and I've been hearing this that, uh, you know, we've known this for years that if, you, if a child has poor uh, digestion as a result of diarrhea, as a result of dirty water, often in rural areas but also in urban areas, that the absorption of food would be limited. But new information which was presented to this workshop talked about the mechanism of action which I thought was particularly fascinating that too many episodes of diarrhea flatten the cells in the intestine and absolutely prevent the absorption of micronutrients in particular. And so therefore you're not getting the, the ability to have the intellectual stimulation that Martine was talking about. Uh, so it's really an example of how you keep getting more and more data and to, until it starts to match available knowledge. And that one, I really, the, the health panel, I, I saw a brilliant use of data uh, combining water and health and some food availability. The second one, I really, my second take home, was um, a panel that didn't think it was about governance. It thought it was about metering in, uh, in irrigation, and that was what it was billed as. And uh, we had three people from Nebraska, Texas, and Oman uh, talk about the installation of water meters uh, with irrigators. Uh, a lot of things in common around the world, universal resistance, universal decision that this was probably because somebody was going to come after their water, uh, and uh, you know, th th real difficulties in even getting to the installation of meterage, particularly in, in places where there hadn't been measuring before. But what was fascinating to me is that done properly, and each of these examples were eventually, as they would be the first to say to you, you'd first you do it wrong and then you figure out how to do it right, but uh, that done properly, the information, the data that was available through smart meters and irrigation turned into information and the information started to turn into knowledge about what had to happen for the water availability in these areas, and the farmers themselves uh, became very much party to the fact that things had to change. And so it was, uh, as I say, they thought it was a panel really about uh, metering and how meters get introduced, but the governance lessons were extraordinarily strong uh, coming out of that session. So that was my, my second take home message. And the third one was also, we were, we were all taken with the yield gap presentation, obviously. And uh, to repeat the question I made to Ken Castleman, um, I think that there's a lot of missing inputs for the poorest farmers that have to do with their farming is not a business because they don't have access to market. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the fact that credit may simply not be available, that land title may be in question, great distance from roads, uh, health problems, uh, problems in some societies about the farmer not being allowed to leave the farm if she's a woman. So extension services that simply do not reach as far as women. So that all of those have to be factored into the mix when you're dealing with the poorest farmer because the choice of seed and the agricultural inputs are far from being the main factors determining whether the yields are going to be met or not. So uh, that was my third takeaway also. And so I've now been tasked by Ken to make him up a slide saying what these things are about. So. Uh, so those are my three takeaways. So uh, I, I hope all of you had good takeaways too, and I hope by now each of you has reached out to the piece of paper in front of you and has figured out one suggestion that you're going to make uh, about what we're doing, what we should be doing in the next year's, uh, next year's panel. So on to the next issue. How do we take all of these messages, if not to the farmer, to Agra, to, uh, to uh, further the further work that you do in getting messages out, how do we take what we've learned here? Um, how do you hope people will take these lessons uh, as, as they leave this conference? Do you want to start, Bashir? And... Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Maggie. Um, 
In terms of my takeaway and, and uh, Martin's which, first one, which is take you to the farmer, um, I think the biggest opportunity we have now uh, in many countries is this um, ICT revolution. I think one thing I heard from this um, uh, conference uh, and which we are helping to facilitate in many countries in Africa or engage with partners is the, is the, is the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in simple terms, the mobile phone we had could be the next uh, extension advisor for farmers. And we see that happening. Farmers in remote areas in Africa, in their field, calling markets, uh, calling for agriculture, or calling for advice. Uh, farmers exchanging information. So I think one opportunity we have to harness is, 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 is the ICT applications. And the challenge that I see, which we need to address as we move on, is to make sure that the information the farmers get is reliable. Uh, and is that, that not always the case? Uh, right, it's not, yeah, she's asking very, she's next to me and sometimes she says, I wish, she's asking me very tough questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess that's your job, eh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that not, it's not always the case, but uh, I think we have upfront, as I mentioned, and as we had throughout, bring in solutions there that is co-created with them that they have confidence in. Farmers themselves can be part of that uh, knowledge. The biggest challenge is the content. In Africa, at least, the content that comes through these simple mobile phones, besides being too simple, uh, is um, the content is uh, a bit shallow some, in many areas. Farm, farmers need much more than they are getting. How can we reliably bring in something that is up to date, that's timely, upon which they can make decisions? Mm -hmm. But we have an opportunity here to use knowledge. The, the importance of that is that in Africa, we have an aging population like in many places. Uh, don't, uh, you know, somewhere around maybe close to 40% of the population in, in these rural areas are youth. And the farmers uh, are increasingly going to become young or they would leave these rural areas for the cities. Mm -hmm. The opportunity we have here is that ICT can become very attractive to youth and, and attract them back to, to, to agriculture. So how can we make this tool applicable uh, to a wide range of partners uh, including young people, and make sure that the information there is very rich. That, that I think, is, is a, 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 a big potential, and B, also raises a challenge. But from what I see, from the, B, the data, big and data uh, um, revolution that we have, uh, we, there's opportunity. Although in, the, in this data sets, big and small data, we need to bring in more of the social side, more of the business side, you know, a lot of information are on the soft skills, um, because right now that's missing. Uh, and more agronomy, you know, so that people can use uh, the internet to get agronomic information. Uh, that, I think that, that's an opportunity. Good. Has the conference suggested any new directions in terms of water and agriculture uh, that you would like to talk about when you get back to Agra? The water part. Uh, Right. Um, you know, the, the, yes, good question. The, it has suggested a lot. Um, typically, when you get agronomists, soil scientists, we don't normally talk about water. We talk about uh, nutrients and agronomy and how to get that yield, yeah. and we think that can close it. We know water is important if there is no rain or irrigation, uh, you don't get much uh, yield. But the, the, our disciplinary trainings and orientations are such that normally the two groups uh, don't sit down as we saw here. And I think that's a unique opportunity. And I thank uh, the, uh, the, the, the Water, Inst Water and Food Institute here for that um, vision. Uh, so one opportunity I, I, I see here is to use this water and Food Institute to create a movement, to create a thinking globally. And I, and I think the basis is there. The expertise in food, 
and Walter, for example, resides in that University of Nebraska and other universities here. Uh, but then you can create partnerships globally so that these teams that are often at, uh, bypass each other can meet and create the solutions that are sustainable. Within Africa and uh, Agra specifically, we have catalyzed uh, what we call soil health consortia in a number of countries. So that institutions that are like-minded that are doing um, uh, agronomy, soil, trying to close yield gaps and agribusiness is working with them, can come together and do not duplicate effort. But often the water part is missing. We don't have that on board. And so I see an opportunity here for docking in with what is happening through such consortia, and there are a number of similar consortia in Africa and beyond where you can actually bring in what is happening uh, uh, um, and the benefits of these groups, food and water and agronomy coming together. The, the last area that I, I, I uh, my takeaway was on the communication. Um, I think, you know, if we, as I said, if we can simplify uh, the knowledge and, and rigorous work around that, we will go a long way with even what we have now in terms of closing the yield gap. The challenge is the capacity is not there in, in, in much of Africa to take this knowledge, the data that is there, and put it in a, in a way that, that policymakers can, can use. We, there's some sense of urgency to do that. The urgency is that, hey, this is a time policymakers, investors in Africa need data. They need information on where to invest, what are the returns to those investments. This is a time we see money going into agriculture, and so we have an opportunity here to seize. The second uh, sense of urgency is that the discussion now is a very at a high level in terms of how do we make agriculture climate smart? And the alliances are being formed. It's the discussions are at policy level. In a few weeks from uh, to, today, there will be a big ministers of, con ministers of agriculture conference in Kinshasa. They are talking about climate smart agriculture. So what uh, data simplified enough communication products can we put in front of their, of their, um, uh, in front of their tables and say, hey, this is, yeah. this is action. Uh, every year, AGRA organizes what's called the Africa Green Revolution Forum for the last four years. Ministers gather their private sector, public sector. There's an opportunity there to bring in what we have in terms of how do you close the yield gaps and do so in a sustainable manner. And then the third thing that is everybody is talking about in Africa and that this growing agriculture and doing so sustainably would help is how do we make agriculture create jobs and, and employ the youth in particular? Yeah. Create employment opportunities for it. We have uh, a huge bulge of growth in our, in our youth population. How can we make this thing attractive? Nobody's interested in agriculture that is not productive. At one ton of maize to the hectare, which is what you see in a smallholder farming system, it will not attract youth, leaving, uh, live, live alone old ones. Even the old ones want to leave the, the, uh, the, um, the villages for the city. So how can we make this agriculture attractive sec enough to employ uh, youth and to generate surpluses for these markets? And I think from what I saw and, 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 the, and the role that uh, you know, the Water and Food Institute can play here, I think we have tremendous influence opportunity to influence globally uh, discussions and decisions and investments. Good, thank yeah. you. Uma, how do you, how do you take these seemingly simple concepts that water is important? It's crucial, as, as Martin said, it's totally crucial to his yields in agriculture. It's crucial to every farmer's yields. And yet, as Bashir says, it's, it's kind of the invisible item. People take it yeah. for granted. Well, I was making a list of um, the sessions that I went to and some of the ideas that came out of them, and this is just seat of the pants list, but uh, I think that the people who organized this conference could really go through some of these presentations to see whether there are messages coming out of the presentations which could be uh, harnessed either to uh, through very effective communication to the audiences where it matters or to build on them. For instance, one uh, conclusion of the 
discussion on uh, groundwater exploitation in California, very interesting presentation and one on climate change this morning was that there are so many risks and uncertainties that we don't really have uh, simple silver bullets for what people should do. But there is a combination of instruments that one can use to increase resilience to uh, climate change and to pressures on water. And so if that is indeed the case that we have lots of options and um, instruments that can be used, then I think one should, um, one should identify them and proselytize on them to say they, there's not one solution, but it's a combination of solutions. And so from that point of view, I found the session this morning on um, groundwater and metering and the whole issues of governance, measurement, uh, the politics of California, <laughs> Uh, and all of that very interesting, but the main message was <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there was another session where there was very good discussion of um, collecting meteorological data in the US by uh, engaging people in voluntarily providing data on a regular basis. And uh, talk about creating employment for youth in Africa if only they could be energized to collect such data in villages um, and send it, I think there could be a lot of new information, very much like what Amazon does, as someone was saying. <coughs> I get routinely emails from Amazon that I should be reading this and I should be doing that. Uh, I think a lot of that kind of data, what people are doing, could be uh, collected through um, through um, cell phones. And finally, I thought the discussion on health was, that session was very, very good. Uh, but what strikes me is that the awareness of the relationship between quality of water and health, especially of young children, is probably not as much on the top of poor people's minds as it needs to be. So I think one of the questions is, are there messages from that session which could, be, um, which could be packaged in a way which would mean more to, say, an audience in South Asia, uh, which may be different than the one in Africa? And, and the communication by the uh, Water for Food Institute could begin to, um, to prepare such mes messages and to begin to deliver them. Uh, without having to wait for all the solutions to yeah. come in. And they have to be delivered by political leaders, by community leaders, by... All sorts of people. In the yeah. mosques, in the, uh, in the churches, right. all the rest of it. Uh, yeah. No, because it's a very powerful problem. And when you talk about the possible loss of 10% of your height and 10% of your intelligence, you know, that is, a, that is a big, big loss. And, and I'm not sure how many poor women who are so busy yeah. just making a living know about these things. Right. So I think just creating consciousness by increasing information mm -hmm. would be a very useful thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. Martin, how do you take it to the farmer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that there is a huge knowledge in the University of Nebraska, uh, Doherty Water for Food Institute, uh, and in the developed agricultural countries that can, can help a lot the undeveloped countries. I think in the way that Frank Richberman, something like that, <laughs> he says that the savannas is the same that the Cerrados area in Brazil. I worked two years in the Cerrados, the huge change that the Embrapa made in, in, in that area to convert it in one of the baskets of the world. So I think that there is a lot of knowledge that today it is, I would say, at the university, at the markets, at the farms, that we can try to adapt it uh, to Africa or to un the undeveloped countries. So I think that there is an, a lot of knowledge that today it is in the world that we can use it. So I think that we must work hard to try to use that at the farm level. No, it is knowledge that we have it. it we have not to invest. We have to invest in, in, in using that in, in those countries. I think that the, 
all the data revolutionary, all the do, all those things, new st stuff for the young people, for the youth that will uh, motivate them to go to the farms. Mm -hmm. if they have all those uh, 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 joys there. I said the best thing it is if they have a good business. If they can have no tillage farming and increase the yield to instead of three tons to go to four or to six, as the uh, or higher than that, as the yield map says, I think that they will create value in their own farms, they will have a good businesses, and the youth people will like to go and to be in the farming. Argentina and Brazil, the amount of agronomists of the last 10 or 15 years increased because we have business, we are doing good business at farming level. So youth people want to go back to work at the farms. Mm. You are a, a, a big farmer, so I mean, you're, getting information is not your problem. As you say, absorbing the information and finding the tools to really use it is. But in smaller farmers in, uh, in South America, how do they get information? Do you, do you, do you ever think about that, how, how they get uh, the, the information that they need to, to change and adjust their farming practices? Yes, today there is a lot of information about the extension services, mm -hmm. public and private extension services. Uh, I find also there is an excellent way of extension is this, the TV, there is yeah. a, agriculture program at the TV when I, I don't like to, to watch mm -hmm. TV, but when I mm -hmm. turn it on, I, I, I always see that canal, yeah. I enjoy it. And I think it's, uh, sometimes I talk about irrigation in the TV. So then I, I visit a small farmer or someone and said, hey, I saw you in the TV the other day. So a lot of people uh, watch that TV, so it helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think today the Cellular phones, we do not have information in the cellular phones, but I think in, we are 40 million people in Argentina and I think that we have 60 million cellular phones. So, yes. <laughs> I, I, sure that it is going to be a very good way to reach all those people that are far away. So okay. I think that that's maybe the way. Thank you. Bashir, you wanted to add a, a piece Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, now, it's, it's just Martin's point of, um, uh, I think fostering opportunities for knowledge sharing. Uh, and, um, you know, th there's a lot of knowledge out here, good practices, technologies that may not be current but could be useful elsewhere. I think this whole notion of, uh, you know, trying something out there, leapfrogging, I think was the word that was mm -hmm. leapfrogging that came up. I like that. Yesterday I went to one of the side events, uh, a group that it's going to leapfrog uh, uh, pivotal um, uh, irrigation. irrigation in Tanzania. And that's, that's good and uh, commendable. Um, this is the time now to bring in form partnerships that would see where can these things work and, and uh, don't shy from bringing in technologies that can be modified uh, and, uh, and, uh, through local partnerships. So, this way, I think collectively, we will get to our uh, goal of uh, uh, generating food for, for us all. So I just wanted to bring in you know, uh, this whole idea of trying with uh, mm -hmm. partners outside. Some things that exist in this part exist in Argentina, Brazil, that could help these other nations and, and do it through, through partnerships, yeah. It's an interesting transition from the time when we worried more about the import of inappropriate technology. Yeah. And uh, that was a primary concern that uh, far too many external actors, whether donors, financial institutions, or companies were bringing in uh, technology that couldn't be maintained and really was inappropriate. So maybe we've moved on from that to the time when the absorptive capacity is a lot higher. Can we have the house lights on, please? Um, there may be nobody here when we turn on the lights. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, I heard some laughter. So, <laughs> And I hope people have some ideas for what uh, advice we should be giving to the Darty Center on water and food in terms of content. Um, Somebody has to find the house lights. Is somebody up behind the microphone? Good, okay, I can actually see somebody there. So uh, please go ahead. Okay. 
I think you've had many excellent suggestions in your discussion. I particularly like the, the idea of uh, profitability uh, as, a, as a driving force. That's, that's uh, uh, important. The microphone is uh, not on. Is your microphone on? Oh, here, is my microphone on? I'm not sure. I think it is. It's coming on now, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just saying you've had many good ideas, and I particularly like the idea of profitability as a motivation, recognizing that uh, profitability will bring people into agriculture, um, and the importance of public health is important. But the, the one other thing that we haven't really heard too much about uh, that I can recall is uh, the role of political instability uh, in, uh, in agriculture, and, you know, having uh, at my age, I've been listening for a long time to the news about, you know, all the diff political difficulties, particularly in Africa. And I wonder how that influences uh, data collection, for example. You look at an average. Is that average contaminated with some places where yields are virtually zero because of human displacement due to political instability? In other places, it's not so bad. That, that would influence uh, the solutions that uh, we seek. And a lot of the things that you've talked about have assumed uh, a reasonably stable infrastructure, and yet mm -hmm. the news tells us there's a lot of instability. What do you think about that? Okay, thank you. Is somebody trying to find the lights? I didn't quite get the highest question. Uh, uh, political instability and the impact that it has on, uh, on gathering data oh. as well as doing other uh, factors of you know, trying to support okay. issues. Are we trying to get some, it's coming? That's all the light. light That's all the light we have. Can we turn some of these down then? <laughs> I think there's somebody standing over there. So your question. Oh, that's that's better. Yes. Oh, we start. You start to emerge now. <laughs> so your question was your, your your suggestion for future work is you know pl play with the theme of profitability as a motive force and see how that works and then your question is about uh, uh, political instability and the impact that it has on agriculture okay we'll come back to that yes a suggestion for future work international water management institute um, the session was well organized i could see a lot of uh, global pictures that has been shown on the day one it really opens up uh, promising ideas for uh, thinking what we are doing and how we have to go beyond the future. But uh, what I see the gap in this uh, whole session is we always see that uh, 9 billion people is going to come in 2050 and we also saw a lot of technological investment and I see the growth is taking place in terms of agriculture yield. But what is missing is that the storage, the food grain storage. So uh, I think this particular conference can bring a lot of political dimensions of how we can really transform the storage system. Because the technology is there, the farmers are working day and night, they are producing more food, but we are not able to store it. I can give example, uh, like in India, I come from a state called Maharashtra, mm -hmm. where the farmers are uh, storing all the onions because currently the price is cut. They don't want to sell it with a cheaper price, so what happened is that the onions get rotten now because the prices are very low and they are not able to st uh, sell it in a better rate. So if the big data or the small data can really connect the farmers and say that this is the price today and you should harvest a little later because the price is very bad as per the economist what they projected. So there is some kind of a missing element of this if we could able to solve the solution for farmers I think it will be a big way to uh, help the farmers and also produce, uh, not only produce, but also to save the people who are really in hunger. So this is what my message for uh, mm -hmm. this session. Very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, other ideas coming up? Yes. Thank you. Well, um, Marcos Folegati, I'm also part of this International Advisory Board. We've been working with MAG, Bashir, Uma. Martin, Pasquale, Colin, and Peter. Well, uh, I just, I'd like to highlight two points. Uh, first of all, the impact of water on human health, I think is a key issue. So this, in this conference, they brought that idea, and studies 
the human animal ecosystems interface is a, is a key issue. Many countries, they have to, to reuse the, the water, but this is not being very well organized. There is no studies on there. There are a lot of problems on health. I think this is some, something that we need to, to keep motivating people to present some studies on that. So another thing I'd like to, to mention is the global yield gap water productivity that we've been uh, listening many people talk. Now we know much more about this project. And the, the challenge is going to be how we're going to integrate all the economy analysis, the social, local problems you're going to have around the world, so, and how much water is going to be available on those watershed. We're going to see all these gaps. So how are we going to fill this gap considering the policies going to have in these in this watersheds and all that? I think this is, could be the next step that we should motivate people to look at. I think it's a very good start. We can have many people bringing contributions to, to what is being uh, presented here for the future. So then I have this, this problem, right? This, this thing that I have in my mind. We're going to, we have the, the gap, yield, but we also have the, some gap uh, of educations. We're going to have a gap of information. We have a gap on extension that we not reach all those people. I have in my mind a map that could have all this information together, and then we're going to have strategies to work in specific places. This is the contribution I have. Thank you very much. You must have come in late because we announced that you were a member of the advisory group early on and said we were glad to be working with you. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you for those suggestions. Very useful. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Monica Norby from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. You have um, to speak quite close to the microphone. Okay, sorry. Discovering. I'm Monica Norby from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, I really liked the comments about communication. I think. That is a theme that cuts across everything we do. And uh, I think from scientists communicating with farmers to just it cuts across everything. And that might be a future topic for the conference. But I also, uh, I look around the conference and there aren't that many young people here. We have the students, um, at, and, but not very many uh, young scientists. And I think a, a conference around uh, developing the future generation of water and food security experts would be really fascinating. I think uh, we could get, and education is one of the three areas that the Institute focuses on. I, and I think it would be really, really useful to get together uh, young people, students, young professionals uh, from the private public sector and, and get them here to talk about these issues and, and the ideas they can bring to it. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, John Gates, uh, Climate Corporation. Um, I think I'll first riff on Monica's suggestion because I had something similar in mind. Um, I'm sort of working now in the trenches of data science and agriculture and hydrology. And when we do recruiting, we're sort of partitioning between the data scientist, statistician uh, type recruits and um, people with domain expertise in hydrology and uh, agronomy and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that the natural sciences and the agronomic sciences want to completely outsource the, um, the data usage uh, in that way. Um, you know, having worked in this field for, you know, a lot of field projects, there's an awful lot of context around the data. Um, so, you know, what would happen if we trained the next generation of agronomists to be uh, highly quantitative and could do this work um, with sort of a, a comprehensive understanding of the environments? Um, the other observation I wanted to make just briefly is that, you know, in previous years in, in my thinking, I, I've often thought about the, the challenges in the developing world and in the first world to be quite different and needing different sets of expertise, different types of projects and so forth. Um, I still think that in many ways, but I was also struck in the presentations over the last couple of days 
at the um, kind of the emergence of some, mm. some commonalities. Uh, so remote sensing technologies, for example, uh, low cost sensor arrays. Um, I think there, there may be an emerging <coughs> um, uh, sort of uh, convergence in the types of approaches we start to think about, at least on the, uh, on the data gathering side. Many thanks. <coughs> Other suggestions for future, for future work? These are good ideas. Yes, I think I see somebody there. Yes, Francisco Munoz Arriola, University of Nebraska Lincoln. I enjoy the conference in many, many senses, uh, from the local perspective to the global one. From the uh, many dimensions, from the economical, from the physical sense, as well from the social and the biological and biochemical one. I think uh, looking into the agro systems or the water systems, we are still grappling and being unable to integrate not just the different components of the water or the agro systems, but we also uh, struggle to integrate these different stages in development of data and acquiring data and transforming such data into information. So the exploration, discovery, the engineering of new technologies toward investigating the mechanisms to integrate data, transforming into information, I think is key. And this will enhance many of the, com many of the com comments you made. One of them, which I second, uh, Monica, is certainly the issue of communication. Communicate information is key. Transforming the data into information is, is valuable and is one of the key message, messages that I see. A second one is regarding what we also observe here as a snapshot of current conditions or previous conditions, which is the historical context. But we didn't see a lot about what is gonna be in the future. In terms, we saw climate change, certainly, but we didn't address fully how we can improve predictability, that ability to see into the future for the farmers, for example, what may happen for them in the next water year. That is key and our knowledge is just in the early stages because we, we see probably our ability to predict goes in the following two weeks. The seasonal forecast is just in an early stage, and we probably need to better understand that in order to provide more and more a valuable data and information to the small and big farmers. Mm -hmm. So that's my, those are my points. Wow, you, I think you need a combination of soothsayers as well as, uh, <laughs> as, well as uh, data managers to do that, but that's, it's a good idea, try and, because our climate people this morning were saying this, that uh, you know, the, these things are only real when they get very granular and people can start seeing themselves in it. So uh, it's exactly what you're saying. So you know, how do you then take the data and try and allow the farmer or allow the community to start having a forward perspective on where they're gonna be? Not easy, but uh, I think quite essential. Yes. Thank you, my name's Deborah Berry, and I'm the regional coordinator of the Global Water Initiative from, the, from Central America. We work in East and West Africa and Central America. And I, I wanna thank everybody, and particularly Roberto for the invitation. It's been, um, it, it's kind of a 70s phrase, but it's been kind of mind blowing um, to learn uh, about the efforts that are being put in a, to massive data generation and the intent to make it, turn it into information. I think everything that's been said about this is crucial. I'd like to comment from what I consider to be um, the next steps, particularly from the smallholder perspective. I think this level of data generation, the possibility of it, um, and to put it to use for Im as information and then become knowledge, for smallholders, it means you need a, you need a commitment to the public sector. I think the private sector in most of the countries that we work in will jump at this. They already are. They're moving in, into precision, precision agriculture rather rapidly. But for the smallholder, it's a huge gap. And the gap is not just the yield gap. The gap is really the institutional and scientific yeah. technical capacity to be able to even look at it and interpret it. In most of the countries where we're working, the, the agricultural sector has been not just underfunded, it's been decreasingly 
losing funding and is dilapidated behind the curve. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of leadership is really getting older and retiring. We, we look for soil scientists in the region and they're almost an endangered species. So it's, it's really, um, it, it's something to be concerned about if you want to be able to get, you know, really use what we're, we're, we're talking about generating. And then with the farmers too, I mean the connection with the big and the little data I thought was great. I think that's what needs to happen. We think that's what needs to happen. But it means bringing local knowledge into um, the combination of the data and information because the, the capacity to interpret really means understanding the landscape. And, and uh, the, I think Philip um, Owens mentioned, said it at one point, we need to understand what's even in the, some of the older scientists' heads mm -hmm. or the people that know the regions that we're working in because they can interpret for us things that we'll never be able to get out of the sensing information. Okay. So I think putting the two together is really important. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thanks very much for your comments, and I, I'd like to give each of the panelists uh, two or three minutes to give their, uh, their own ideas on where we should go from here, plus any comments they'd like to make on any of the questions. And I'm hoping that Martine uh, and Bashir will both take up the question about the impact of political disturbances and what, you know, what, what impact this has on agriculture and uh, on qu trying to gather regular information about agriculture as well. But, uh, uh, what suggestions might you have that haven't been raised in terms of where we go from here? Uma, do you have what, any that you still have on your list or are you happy with the list that's come up and what are your closing thoughts? Um, I have um, two kinds of thoughts. One is, um, you know, a great deal of things that we talked about have substantial investment implications I mean, if I look at the water and sanitation issue, for instance, uh, there are two components to it. One is just information about the impact of poor quality water and sanitation on health, uh, which one can convey to poor people and uh, hopefully create awareness so that they become more demanding of the quality of infrastructure, et cetera. But if one uh, looks at the financial implications of investing in uh, water and sanitation, they are tremendous. And that was the reason why earlier I was pointing out that a lot of, first of all, lack of investment in rural sector in many countries has led to decapitalization of agriculture and rural areas. So we talk about uh, uh, new information, instruments, knowledge, etc., and uh, uh, and phones, cell phones. Uh, but in many cases, poor people are making very complex decisions about when they buy a cell phone. They know that the return to investment in a cell phone is very high compared to doing many other things, including buying more food. So. Uh, the question, I think, going forward in linking this big data and small data is how can we bring the knowledge about what is what are really the constraints that small farmers and poor people are facing in the rural areas through these new sources of information? Mm -hmm. And I think if we somehow think more creatively uh, about the comment our friend was making about uh, knowing more about what's happening in communities in Central America more directly and on a regular basis to see what does it mean for policy, what does it mean for investments, what does it mean for information. And I don't think we have honed in our knowledge and ability to use these new tools in a far more focused way. In order to do that, I think we'll have to go beyond the rhetoric of nine billion people and et cetera, to say what does it mean for this community if we want to improve their state of affairs. There's a lot of work to be done. There is, there is. You're not gonna be unemployed, <laughs> so. <laughs> Bashir, what's your, did, is, yeah. does this list meet mm -hmm. your thoughts about what we need to do in the future? Do you wanna add any and do you wanna make any closing comment? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, it does, does in many ways, maybe I'll just add that as we think of uh, the next conference or, or even influencing conferences uh, and discussions that are already going on before that, 
I think from the, the Africa perspectives, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the big discussion is around um, how do you grow agriculture in Africa? Uh, how do you make it sustainable? Sustainable intensification, we had a lot that, and water is, is gonna be an important one, but it's missing from, from the discussion. And so perhaps in the next conference, if we could um, you know, bring that on board in a big way, sustainable ag, uh, what does it mean? Uh, where does um, conservation agriculture fall in? It's very exciting to hear. I think it was in one of the presentations where uh, in this country, nine, was it 2012? Drought compared to 1998. Mm -hmm. The difference in yield, both were dry years, but the difference in yield was something like 40, 41% in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, that is remarkable. How was that achieved? Mm -hmm. Could we bring in those innovations to Africa where most of the agriculture and Asia, I guess, in some region, some regions of it where it's uh, rain fed? So bringing hope uh, uh, and solutions to, to these areas where the potential for growing agriculture and to feed the world is still high. But where we, if we can start on early enough in bringing in what is sustainable into these uh, systems that are growing, that would really help. And I think that would be a very good uh, intervention for the next conference. Wanna, just to emphasize that Africa is not the same as it was. It's growing. And it's growing positively. And you can see that in agriculture. Farmers are accessing in many areas improved seeds, fertilizers, uh, markets, uh, even markets that are now improving storage problems. Uh, things are changing. Uh, the policy environment is, is getting better. Notwithstanding, there are many, many countries that have still political issues. It's, uh, you know, this whole uh, democratization is still new. We are going through a phase where maybe uh, other nations, other regions have gone through. But for the most part, uh, things are changing for the good. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so trying to respond to the question on, 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 on how do you get data and agriculture to grow in, in, in those. Yes, there are some countries, but for the most part, I would say things are, are normal, and this is the time to partner and, and harvest that data in a way that we can share. And we have uh, institutions in place, private sector, public sector, the CGIRs that we, we can tap into to, 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 to get that data uh, together. One final area that I think as we move forward, we should really emphasize, particularly for Africa, is capacity development. Mm -hmm. uh, this is capacity, not only individuals, but in strengthening the institutions, the universities, the national research systems, the regional and sub-regional organizations that talk to the policy makers, the, the ability to generate and transform this data into something that people can make decisions yeah. upon. I think that is missing. I see that resides here, resides in many other regions, but I think that will be a true basis for helping each other. And building capacities, I think that Barbara, Barbara the lady who talked, there are no soil scientists or very few, few soil scientists or water scientists so I think this is, it will resonate well with the, with the partners in that area when, if we come in from our capacity and institutional development. I think that would be a very useful thing to have in some way included or, uh, in, in, in our next forum. Okay, Thank good. You. And when you've grown enough so soil scientists in AGRA, maybe you can send a few of them Absolutely. to Central America. Absolutely. Good, that would be good when Africa starts providing the technical assistance that's needed mm -hmm. in some of the areas. Martin. We have time. <laughs> Not much, but a little. <laughs> no, what I would say, uh, what I like a lot of the Institute, if it is the communication, mm -hmm. the, the networking job that uh, the institute, institute is doing with other institutions. So to share all that knowledge, uh, for me, it is very, very important. So I, I like that for the future. Uh, and also for this conference, what it is very important for me too, it is to, to uh, be the conference of the latest discoveries of the latest research that you are having here in the States and sharing what we are doing in the rest of the world. So that like open our mind 
to, to be more creative. So mm -hmm. I like that. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let me lead you, read you the list of uh, what we're handing over on behalf of everybody in this room uh, to the thinkers that'll be putting together the next, we hope, conference. Uh, and these are random, and as I say, they're not in priority order, but uh, ideas that came up. What are the tools to use data? How do we make them available? How do we make them more accessible? Uh, how do you co-create solutions with farmers? Where has it been done? Uh, where are the success stories there? Uh, how has this made things more effective and make implementation easier? Communication, uh, the, the, from the science to the farmer, is really needs a great deal of improvement. How do we communicate? What are the tools, the effective tools of communication that are actually working? Find out why the water part is still missing in so many agricultural discussions. It seems so improbable and impossible, but uh, let's, let's explore that more. Why is the water part still missing? Uh, profitability as a motive force, can we explore that a little more and see if we can do anything to uh, increase the velocity of the motive force? Storage. I'm not sure how you work the water in agriculture into that, but certainly the technology and the techniques of storage are absolutely essential. By the way, the Ethiopian Commodity Exchange has resulted in increased construction of storage to store that which has been brought to the Commodity Exchange prior to sales. So they put up about 16, 17 warehouses around the, the country as part of the Commodity Exchange. Look that up, it's very interesting. Um, reuse of water, including agricultural water. Uh, what are the health implications of this? What do we know about agricultural reuse, particularly of, of sewage water and the implications for health here? Youth in agriculture, how do we bring youth into our discussions um, and get their input into the future of these issues? Um, something about prognoses. Oh, prediction and prognoses. How to get these down to the level of the farmer too. Uh, got that one. Um, putting this to the case for smallholders, putting, sorry, it isn't let my hand, I'm listening so hard my handwriting deteriorated. How to find the investment and financing that is needed in this sector. How to get to sustainable agriculture. And can we use this meeting as a showcase for the latest research results in water and agriculture so that people who come to it are really up to date on what's being thought about? So my clock has just run out to zero. The list has run downward. So the only task that remains is to hand this back to Roberto uh, with all of our thanks again for a very well-organized meeting. And could you join me in thanking the panel? Thank you. Thank you. Good, okay. I know. <clears throat> I'm glad you stayed right there. So, um, thank you, uh, Maggie, for that really extraordinary job, and all your colleagues on the panel. Um, really wonderful uh, way to end this, uh, this conference. Um, some great take home messages, both the individual ones as well as the uh, collective ones. Um, really good suggestions for the future conference um, and a lovely list that you came up with at the end. So we obviously have a lot to be uh, thankful to you um, and everybody in the room for giving us such a head start on, uh, on next steps. Um, so it really is, a, I couldn't have thought of a better way to bring this conference to a close. Um, I also very much appreciated the, the feedback on the conference itself, uh, the organization. It's nice to hear that, that things went well, that you felt it was, was good. Um, and clearly, the sessions on health um, and on the Global Yield Gap Atlas really resonated. Um, and those were two very important um, things that, that helped our own thinking in how to shape this conference, so we're really very pleased that, that those uh, decisions really echoed with all the participants. Um, personally, I've always found this set of conferences a huge learning experience, and this one has been no different. I mean, I come away from these conferences really always 
with, a, with a different mindset on, on, on many issues, and I hope and I know that, uh, that that was true with everybody um, in this room. Um, formally, we will be presenting, we will be preparing proceedings of the conference. We'll be preparing, as we mentioned on Monday, a short uh, brief report that we will take uh, as a contribution to the World Water Forum. Uh, but in the end, the most important things are the way that these conferences change one's own thinking uh, and therefore one's own action. Um, there are many people to, uh, to thank um, and not many minutes to thank them in because I think we're supposed to start the next session in about two uh, minutes. But um, let me just do a little bit of, of thanking. We've already thanked earlier um, all our sponsors, so I won't um, uh, repeat the ones that I have thanked already, but there are a few that I need to, uh, to emphasize separately. Um, first is that we have had the benefit in uh, organizing this conference um, at two thought partners, um, which were the International Water Management Institute and the Global Water Initiative. Um, and I'd really like to thank Jeremy Bird and Peter McCormick and Judy Vanderblick and Meredith Giordano of IMI and Deborah Barry and Kemi Seesink and Paul Hicks from the Global Water Initiative. It's really been a pleasure to work with you and, and uh, really, um, I think, um, made a conference that would have not been possible if we'd worked on our own. Um, Secondly, we do have a conference uh, organizing committee. We had uh, this committee, it's an internal faculty committee. Um, they really help shape very much the conference content. Um, and, uh, and several of the members of the uh, conference committee are here, and I'll just mention them quickly. Mike Hayes, Eddie Rogan, Patricio Grassini, Alan Kolop, Trenton France, Francisco Munoz Arriola, John Gates, Don Wilhite, Haishun Young, uh, we're all members of this uh, conference committee. Thank you so much. The um, uh, International Advisory Panel um, have played uh, uh, an important role, both explicitly, as we've seen just now, but also implicitly in many different ways uh, throughout the conference, and we're very, very much appreciative of that. Uh, you have, on different occasions, been uh, had interventions uh, and presentations and introductions by the senior leadership of the university, but I really want to uh, acknowledge um, all the way in which they have contributed uh, to the conference. They provide uh, wonderful support and feedback to us uh, on a very constant basis through what is called our internal working group. Um, and that includes the president of the university, Jim Linder, but also the chancellor of the University of Lincoln, of Nebraska, Lincoln, Harvey Perlman, also Ronnie Green, Prem Paul, Tom Farrell, Monica Norby, who is here, Bob Meany, who is here, and Ron Yoda. Um, and of course, the board members, J.B. Binnikin and Moans Bay, and uh, Jeff Rakes have been really wonderful uh, throughout, so thanks to all of them. And coming closer and closer to those who are um, most directly involved in, in uh, the, uh, you know, in what made this uh, conference tick, I did want to thank very much uh, the Underwood events team, uh, the team in green that you've been seeing, or green-blue that you've been seeing. It's led by Mike Underwood and Amy Pierce. I hope they're somewhere in the room, but they've been fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Mike and, uh, and Amy and all your colleagues. It's been really a pleasure to work with you. Um, and, uh, and of course, the conference support team led by Rachel Herpel, who I believe is there on the right. <laughs> but the team also includes uh, many people, uh, Dana Ludwig, 
Gillian Klukas, Jesse Starita, Craig Chandler, Rochelle Young, Cheryl Williamson, Julia Stouch, if you could stand up so that we can acknowledge all your support, that would be really uh, appreciated. Thanks so much for all your help. Um, and in all these cases, um, it's really the participants, uh, everyone in this room and those who contributed yesterday and the day before, it's what makes the conference come alive, it's what makes the conference tick, um, it's what makes it all worthwhile. So thank you all for being here and uh, sharing these moments with us. Let me now declare the conference closed. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs>